morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Megan Kelly, and today, as you know, is a somber day. It has been 17 years, 17 years since the September 11th attacks. Right now, ceremonies are taking place here in New York, in Washington, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And the names of the nearly 3,000 victims are being read aloud, as they are every year at this time. It was a morning that shocked the nation, in, indeed the world, and it changed our way of life in this country. Joining me now to talk about this, this day, and what's happened since, NBC's own Stephanie Goss, Jenna Bush Hager, and Jacob Sobra. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. But it's hard to believe it's 17 years. <laughs> it really is. It's hard to believe, and it's, it's hard to sort of get the 30,000-foot perspective on the number of things that have changed for us as Americans and in our country since that day. Jenna, let me start with you on it, since your dad was our president mm -hmm. on that day, and it would come to define his presidency, along with so many other things. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I can't believe it's been 17 years. I, I uh, was a freshman in college at the University of Texas, a sophomore. Actually, I just started my sophomore year, and one of the, we were naive, and one of the deals with my parents, you know, when he told us he was going to run for president, I think when your kids say, you know, we're worried about this. We said, we want to be normal, Dad. We just want to be normal. So he said, okay, you won't have a lot of Secret Service. We'll make that deal. We'll try to keep the Secret Service footprint really low. And on that day, I woke up and I opened my blinds at the dorm where I was living, and there were a lot of men and sitting in plastic chairs in, in the courtyard of where I was living. And I knew that something had happened. Um, and I got driven away um, and couldn't talk to my friends or, or anyone, but I think the thing is, is that so many people lost so much, um, and really I was just like the thousands of college kids who felt like the innocence of our, our country was shattered. You know, it's interesting, her story is actually a really good metaphor for what happened to the country in general. It was this moment where we all realized the fragility of our nation and our way of life we all had those plastic chairs outside our doors after that, and we continue to have them. Every time you go through an airport, every time you're in a crowd and you look to your left and right and you're looking for a backpack on the ground, yeah. it changed everything for us. I want to tell the audience that um, at 8.46 a.m., it was American Flight 11 that struck the North Tower first. At 9.03 a.m., United Airlines Flight 175 struck the, the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And every year at this time. We have a moment of silence to honor those killed at that moment. We're going to join uh, that moment now. Mary Catherine Murphy Fofa. Nicholas Andrew. 2,977 in its innocence perished that day. A day that would change us forever and remind us both of what has divided some in this world and what binds us together as Americans. I mean, the thing I remember more than anything when watching it at home, I was still practicing law at the time, was the support that the country offered for one, for one another and how we came together. And you saw the lawmakers go out on the front of the Capitol and sing America the Beautiful. And you look at the lawmakers lined up there in that shot, Rudy Giuliani and Chuck Schumer and Kristen Gillibrand and Governor Cuomo, all of these faces of New York, New York State, who have this shared history and this shared reverence for what happened that day and those who were lost. And it's a reminder, it's a reminder that there is goodness out there along with the darkness and that there is a way we can come together as Americans, remember what we stand for. I have to tell you, um, you know, it gives me chills to hear you say that. And I was here, I was downtown. Uh, I was a freshman at uh, NYU and I was in Washington Square Park 
Um, and I was on my way to class uh, when all of this happened. And I think it was my seventh day of school here. I, I came from Los Angeles. I had just come to New York City. I didn't know anything about New York. I was completely intimidated by this place. And uh, it, it changed, obviously, the way that I experienced New York, that everybody experiences this city um, forever. Everybody came together. I went on to work uh, for Mike Bloomberg, uh, the mayor of New York, as an advance guy. And I was down at Ground Zero uh, on every day of remembrance uh, of 9-11. Um, people that are in this city today, people that have uh, been in this city over the course of the last 17 years are forever changed yeah. by what happened. Mike Bloomberg here that now, day. Re registered independent, Rudy Giuliani, of course, a Republican, Schumer and Gillibrand, Democrats all standing there shoulder to shoulder because we don't think about partisanship on a day like this. Um, you know, I was just remembering some of the heroes from that day mm. and looking up just some of the stories. Of course, we all know that uh, not only was New York attacked, but D.C. was attacked. And uh, a flight went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and we'll have that moment just a bit later in the show, where those brave passengers, Todd Burnett, Mark Bingham, Jeremy Glick, Todd Beamer, led that group to attack that cockpit, which had been commandeered by the terrorists, and Todd Beamer with the famous, mm -hmm. let's roll. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They knew what was happening by the time it got to Shanksville. They knew that flight was not headed for anything good, and indeed we now know it was headed for the Capitol, and they found it within themselves to try to fight. The flight went down, 44 lives were lost, but it could have been so much worse, right? And I think about, right, yeah, it's I can remarkable. see, it's emotional, because yeah. you think of the sacrifice and the heroism. I mean, 17 heroism. years later, but what makes me tear up is that those people have children that will never see their parents again. Um, and their names need to be heard and told. So thank you for saying them. Um, I love that we still remember these people that were heroes um, and they were the epitome of all that is good in our country. And I've gotten to interview some of their kids. They refuse to be defined by that day, but they live a, in a way to make this world a, a place of peace and it's just it's so amazing, and I hope we get back to that place where I, if you could feel it across our country, not just in New York, yeah. where everybody came together. Right. And that yeah. was a good feeling. Mm. They make you proud to, to be an American. Just very, very quickly, there's another story to be told, and that's the first mm -hmm. responders. That's right. There have been more that's first right. responders that have died because of going to Ground Zero and working at Ground Zero than died on that day. Mm -hmm. And we don't pay enough attention to what happened to them and what continues to happen to them dying prematurely from cancer, most of them. One of them, uh, one, one of the first responders, although he doesn't like that term, is joining us yeah. as our next guest and has an incredible story um, to share. But I... I I agree with you. My, one of my best friends, godfather to my son, is Sean Newman, who's a firefighter, uh, who was there that fateful day. He, can't, he commandeered a vehicle to get down. He was off duty. But um, 13 men in his company went down to 9-11. Only 12 returned. Hmm. Um, Sean, thank God, is alive and well and, and you know, important to my family. But he has devoted the rest of his life toward helping the guys who are down there. And, and they live every day uh, with the fear of what could happen. You know, these firefighters are still alive and wondering what the future might hold. Every single day. We have to continue to, this is a tragedy that continues to unfold 17 years later with some of these uh, brave, brave men and women still passing away. Thank you, panel. We're going to be back with our panel. We're going to pick it up um, with some news when we come back after the break. And we're back now with our panel, NBC's Stephanie Goss, Jenna Bush Hager, and Jacob Soberoff. And we want to bring you some news this morning, the latest on a story we've been covering, which is the fall of Les Moonves, uh, who is now out at CBS. He was running the entire station, not just the news group, all of CBS, and, but not apparently all the way out. Uh, we told you yesterday that now more than a dozen women have accused him of sexual misconduct and or intimidation, claims he denies. But now we're learning that not only could Moonves receive a massive severance, the New York Times is suggesting upwards of $120 million, uh, but he, he may be sticking around CBS for another year as an unpaid advisor and is supposedly set to receive a company security detail for two years. So is that right? I mean, they say this is pending the investigation. If he can be fired for cause, and that... You know, obviously, if he did this thing, everybody's saying, isn't that cause? Well, we don't know because we haven't seen his employment agreement. Did CBS know about any of these things? Was he clever enough to get something written into his agreement saying no prior acts, you know, to this date will qualify? It has to be from, you know, 2016 forward. We don't know. It's in the deal. But it could be that he walks away with a $120 million check and an office at CBS and this consulting agreement. 
Uh, my understanding with this investigation is that when it concludes, a lot of the information won't be made public. It, privacy issues and a whole number of other things. But among the things that will be made public is how much money he gets in severance. Yeah. And, and that will be a large indicator of, of whether they determined or not he was guilty of the things that he has been accused of. And so that will be, I think, in terms of whether or not he gets this deal where he continues on at CBS, That'll be the, the kind of benchmark. We, we saw this at Fox News. Roger Ailes got a $40 million payout, and he was technically kept on as an advisor, although, you know. It's unbelievable. He, uh, it's, I, 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 was it real or wasn't it real? I don't know. I guess what I continue to think about this morning is if that salary is being withheld pending the outcome of the investigation, why is the office not being withheld? Why is the security yeah. detail not being withheld pending the outcome of the but there is no way that they're actually going to allow this guy back on the premises to see. I don't believe that. There may be something in the deal like, okay, the contract requires that. But I just don't believe, as a practical matter, CBS will do that. I mean, I don't think they can. Right. Can, I mean, can you imagine what message that would send? Responsibility to the women that work there to keep them safe. And it, it, that message is not one that I, I would want to hear. Uh, you guys said something. I was watching you guys yesterday from home. And you guys said something, you in particular, Jenna, that I thought, you know, was just so poignant and spot on. I've been doing this traveling the country on, for the election, asking people what matters to them. What you were saying about the fact that this is not just in the halls of power here. It's mm -hmm. not just in places like uh, 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 media corporations. Um, farmers, uh, yeah. people that are out on the water, people that are uh, in day-to-day -day jobs. Hopefully now, um, this is something that people will speak out about in a anywhere you are, no matter where you are, whoever you are. And how Les Moonves goes out and how CBS handles it sends such a strong message in that regard. That's right. As Her, well. His wife, Julie Chen, who's one of the hosts of The Talk, um, was not there yesterday. Our audience after the show was talking about would she be there, what would she say. She wasn't there. Uh, she issued a statement saying she's taking time off to be with her family, which you can certainly understand. Yes. Um, Les Moonves has issued a statement saying these are, he says, untrue allegations from decades ago are now being made against me that are not consistent with who I am. So far, Julie Chen has stood by her husband. But Sharon Osbourne of The Talk admitted yesterday that she came out early with a statement in his defense that she felt pressured to make. She felt pressure. She's now deleted the tweet in which she suggested that this one was an attempt to discredit Les Moonves before a major court case, asking people not to rush to judgment. Can I just say that, once again, we see the folly of rushing to issue statements defending those who are accused. Just, it doesn't mean you don't support the person if you say nothing. Um, but it does mean you may be putting actual victims in a very difficult position. And, and those who ask others to sign these statements are absolutely putting the, the, the ones receiving the request in a very difficult spot. Especially you when story. you're talking people that prominent, like Sharon yeah. Osborne, and Osborne. Or women who might come forward who are everyday women, like right. we were talking about. You know, they may think, oh, if I come forward, others around me won't believe me. Yeah, I'm going to get shamed, not yeah. only by the, the person being accused, but my, by my colleagues who are yeah. basically going to say, I'm with him. So just a word of caution. Panel, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.